All right. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this webinar presented by Folk Alliance International. There's just a few things that we need to cover before we start today's webinar. When you opened the webinar, a control panel appeared on the screen. The link to access closed captioning live is in the chat box at the top. And it's also, um, it will also be attached to our future recording, which will be on our channel. I'll make sure to post a link to that. You can hide the control panel with a little orange arrow. To submit your questions for consideration, please use the questions menu in the control panel about halfway down. For our content today, we'll mostly be answering questions that you all submitted in advance, so thank you for that. There will be a live question and answer towards the 50 minute mark of today's presentation. We did receive a number of questions prior to today's presentation and our panelists will be answering the most frequently asked ones. There are a few resources in the handout section of the control panel, so please feel free to open those up and download them. Um, and when you close the webinar, a short survey will appear. We would greatly appreciate your feedback. Um, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you on that. So let's begin. We're going to begin today's webinar with a poll. Our first poll is, what is your industry role? And you'll select one of the following categories, artist, industry, arts organization, venue, concert series, festival, talent buyer, or other. And we'll take a peek at the results of that. In just a brief moment. Oh, excellent. We have a lovely mix of um, artists and uh, industry organizations with a couple of venues and a few others. I'm quite curious about that, but let's go straight into our second poll today. Our second poll has to do with your experience level with online teaching. So please do select one of the following. If the categories are imperfect, just choose the closest one. Just take a peek. This will help orient our panelists as to how to deliver the information to you. All right. Wow, that is a very balanced group of folks. Well, welcome everyone from novice to experienced. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's moderator to you. Uh, the program manager here at Folk Alliance International, also the owner of Market Monkeys Management Company, and my dear friend, please welcome Michelle Season. Hello. <laughs> wow, that really is quite a even split of folks who are uh, of all different skill levels teaching online. That's pretty exciting. And I'm curious, I wonder if the, that that other in the uh, roles, I wonder if that's some online educators in higher education, given that Michael and I are both professors, so that might have something to do with that too. Uh, but I am curious very much of the other, so we'll get to know you as we go along. Thank you, Tressa. You are my friend as well. I appreciate you. And thank you, Jared, also for organizing this um, technically. Um, I'm excited to be discussing this topic as it's been very much on my mind as a professor at MTSU um, and as a manager representing artists who are teaching lessons, uh, some who have done it for a while and some who are doing just starting doing it. So I think this webinar is as much for me. It's the best role of the moderators. I want to learn everything I can from you people. Um, so thank you viewers for filling out the questionnaire. That was really helpful in us getting to know who you are. Uh, we've organized this discussion into four categories of topic areas and uh, uh, somewhat in response to the information you provided us when you registered for the webinar. Uh, so we are going to be going through technology and platforms, curriculum and planning, engagement and monetization. And then we'll have a round robin discussion of recruitment and marketing, because I think that applies to all of us um, finishing with a live Q&A. Uh, so let's just get right into it. Uh, I am going to check in with, are we technically all set with Allie and Brad, or should I jump to curriculum planning, and come back to technology and platforms? What do we think? I I am here. I don't know if Brad is connected or not, so okay. I guess we can move with just me, and then he might chime in here. We was having okay. 
connectivity issues. So that sounds great. That sounds great. Okay, good. And I can always come back um, if yeah. he's able to, to get sure. synced up. Uh, yeah. So uh, please uh, let me introduce uh, Allison, Allie, um, Allie Hosbach, and Brad Wencos. So, Brad, when he can join, we'll be so pleased to have you. Um, and they are from TrueFire. TrueFire offers uh, video guitar lessons for students of all skill levels, and they provide artists with a suite of self-publishing, revenue-generating, and educational platforms that can be operated from home or on the road. Uh, so, Allie, I, um, I'm going to, in the format here, we're just going to go to each of you to speak to some of the topics we've discussed in advance of this and then I will pose questions if you need my prompting. But I have a feeling um, you have some great ideas you want to share with us from the True Fire perspective. I'll do the best I can. Yes, so fire yeah. away. <laughs> um, well, uh, you know, instructors, a lot of our instructors, folks chiming in advance of this webinar, uh, are concerned about using the best platforms and tools available to teach online. I wonder what advice you would give them as they are trying to figure out what platforms they're using. Sure, yeah. Um, I think um, for many people, teaching online does not necessarily mean that they have to do a live Zoom or, or Skype, you know, format. Um, a lot of students, you know, really do like learning online, and that doesn't necessarily mean that has to be and take place in a live lesson. So when you're thinking about what that means for yourself and you know the various you know offerings that you could present to potential students, you know I think that it's important to think about the variety of ways that you can you know connect with students, and that will largely drive what you know platform decision you know you ultimately are going to be making in order to serve that content. Um, you know, in our world, we do have a lot of recording, you know, online libraries of lessons, then those lessons are made available, you know, behind a paywall of some kind. So that allows for, you know, certainly some efficiencies from the educator standpoint, um, to be able to compile and work on crafting that content and then making that available for monetization purposes, you know, and access to the student. Um, a lot of times this can also be a way um, to overcome some of the challenges that are associated with, with live, you know, events. Hello, Brad. Like some of the issues we had getting Brad on. Um, you know, sometimes there's, there's challenges with, with live um, events. And so, you know, being able to have an exchange of content um, between the educator and the student, um, still leveraging the tools of off of online, but not having to necessarily rely on the live component to make all of those exchanges is, is can be, you know, in a really efficient way. Um, I, Brad, are you fully connected with us? Can you hear me? I can Welcome, hear you. Welcome, Brad. Oh, Yay. I'm in it. I just had to reboot a couple times. That's all Brad right. Brad Wenko's people. Um, Welcome, Brad. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so I don't know how much you got uh, if you're just jumping in, but um, we are talking about the best platforms to use. And so I just was sort of framing up this concept that the platform and tools you use are going to be dependent a little bit upon how you want to deploy that content to students, you know, whether it's being served live or whether it's being served, you know, pre-recorded, you know, through a paywall of some kind. Um, and so, you know, there's there's benefits to both of those, to both of those scenarios, um, and and for TrueFire in our history, you know, we certainly have a long history of pre-recording content that is serving the student from an on-demand perspective. At the same time, you know, we have seen how very important the educator and that mentorship is, you know, that role is to students' growth, and so that's part of the reason why. The, our platform has evolved over the years as it has in order to serve, you know, and reconnect um, the educator with the student in that mentorship role, but leveraging sort of technology so that it does not have to be done necessarily in that live one-to-one, -one, you know, environment. Um, I know this is 
something that is very near and dear to Brad's heart. And, um, and I, you know, I, I, I'm going to let him talk a little bit about, you know, the platform and some of those, those tools and suites that are available for students today to be able to take advantage of technologies to deploy those educational curriculums. Um, yeah, that, that would be great. Uh, Brad, if you could speak a little about how those, you know, w what those tools are and how you made those choices. I think I'm interested in knowing what types of learners um, want that synchronous learning and what types of learners want the uh, anytime they can have time to access it content. Yeah, um, that's a great question and one that we've spent years and a lot of tears trying to figure out. Um, we started, of course, with um, live teaching, whether it was group webinars, and then we developed a, a live um, synchronous uh, teaching platform. And definitely some students prefer a kind of a one-on-one, -on -one real uh, live, real, you know, real-time experience. Then we started to play around with an asynchronous um, experience where um, uh, students could interact privately with an instructor, but there was no scheduled time necessarily. There was no, you know, performance pressure. They could assimilate there and work on their assignment, um, take as long as they wanted to do that. And I mean, clearly, easily, uh, 10 times as many students prefer the asynchronous experience to the live experience. And what we also found is that artists who, you know, working artists, professional touring, recording artists also prefer the asynchronous experience um, because they don't have to be at a particular location at a particular time. And also when you're working asynchronously, you have can have a stockpile of pre-recorded you know, video content that you can insert, attach, reference, link to. Um, and, and so at the end of the day, what takes an hour in a live uh, real-time lesson takes about 15, 20 minutes. And it's something that artists can do you know, on their iPhone, on the road, in the hotel room, backstage from their home. Um, and, and so today, um, all we offer is a, an asynchronous platform. There's so many great tools uh, to do live, you know, whether it's Zoom or Skype. So we've definitely migrated into the asynchronous world. And, and are your instructors um, then following up with students or is there any synchronous connection? What is the interaction between TrueFire with students? Yeah, so we, um, the, we built, we call it an ecosystem basically, and it's a, it's a suite of platforms that, inter, you know, that stand alone but also plug in together, right? So we have a, uh, uh, a, along with the private lesson platform, we have a platform called Channels. And this serves as um, a, a library of content, a place for all that artists and uh, students to kind of congregate and interact. And, uh, you know, it's kind of a social learning environment. Um, many of our artists do offer a optional Skype or live, you know, Zoom uh, lesson should a student want one. Um, and so there's a lot of, uh, you know, in, in today's world, I think the notion of social learning, you know, kind of roots back to Suzuki, right? He would put a bunch of students in, in, in an, immerse them in a nurturing environment along with other students so that they can interact and, you know, no pressure on turning in assignments. And, and we really, you know, and there are other pedagogies that follow that same approach. And we've kind of, you know, mimicked that approach, but in the digital world. So all of these platforms have student-specific discussion threads, uh, private threads, uh, profiling information, and the ability for the teacher to, in fact, follow up. And every live, uh, I'm sorry, every asynchronous private lesson has its 
you know, everything is logged. So it's not unusual for a student to, you know, take a three month break or a three year break. Um, everything that that educator taught that student, all of those interactions, you know, they're logged so that you know exactly where you left off when you come back. I was muted. One more quick question for uh, for you too. What what type of lesson content would uh, do you recommend instructors focus on creating? What do you think is the most um, important content for instructors to be developing? Yeah, that's that's such a good question. You know, um, without any input, say from students, instructors naturally uh, uh, create lessons based on their perspective, their specialty. But what happens almost in every case is artists will start out with what they consider to be, you know, their curriculum. But once they start interacting with students, the curriculum starts to wrap itself around the student body. So with analytics, with questions, for example, our, our artists are able to go and see you know, how many views every lesson gets. So that right away gives you good indication of what's popular, what's not so popular. And all of the artists also ask for feedback, ask for suggestions. And I would say after about six months, eight months, um, the what the educator is producing content wise, completely different from what they started with, because it has now wrapped around what that student body is really interested in. Yeah, and if I could just add on. Like you want to chime in there, please do. Yeah, Allie, please. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think for also what's sort of interesting about the opportunity for students and educators today is I, I do think there's a lot more uh, latitude and options for the kinds of information that the student is looking for and the offering that that artists can give to fans and students. I mean, there's there's things certainly let's say more of the formal techniques of you know how to navigate the instrument and to technically you know become more proficient. But there's also things you can think about about crafting how you think about music and how you think about you know, creativity and how you think about playing with others and and how you how you can how you use, the, you know, your your tool to express yourself. And, and I think if all of that is just one kind of educational curriculum that can be presented and that is of interest in the same time, there's plenty of things that are I you know, fun, you know, jam, you know, play along tracks and, you know, kind of thinking a little bit more um, workout centric and fun. And so, you know, for educators out there who are thinking about, let's say, you know, embracing more educational in their, uh, you know, tactics into what it is that they're doing, especially now, you know, I, I guess we encourage people to think more broadly and to think about what it is that they're their fans and students and people you know are are interested in and what they can bring to the table and it doesn't need to be the same thing that the next educator is bringing to the table i think everybody brings you know this unique voice and this unique perspective of it which is why it makes it so magical and why you know even at true fire you can have many different ways of that somebody you know, talks about scales, but they're all presented a little bit different and, and students want to connect with someone that has, you know, a unique vision. And so I don't think you, you know, for the newer people out there or for the people who are, you know, have been doing it and looking to sort of ramp up and how to grow that part of their business to not be afraid to think beyond, you know, like to think about their craft, you know, sort of holistically with these tools. So that's all I, have to say. I love that we're thinking about both both music craft, so, music craft and teaching craft, which is a yeah. beautiful way to think about it, Ali. And I think also this notion that you can have um, form and structure and 
and using a platform in a structured way and also customize and give that personal touch. I think that's really cool. Let's let's hear now from Michael Moyes from Berkeley Online. Berkeley Online is the online school of Berkeley College of Music. They offer accredited certificate, undergraduate, and graduate degree programs taught by the college's faculty online. Michael uh, teaches Music Theory 101, Music Theory 201, Harmony and Function, and Music Foundations. Welcome, Michael. And <laughs> unmute. Hi, oh, there you unmute. are, my friend. <laughs> Very good. Um, Zoom problems or, or, yeah, webinar problems. Here I am. So, yeah, Michael, I have some questions for you, but I, um, I, if there's anything you want to lead off with before I do that, just uh, give us uh, your thoughts. Well, I'll just say by um, by my account from the poll earlier, uh, it looks like I'm in cahoots with about 82% of you as an artist slash industry. And then if the other are in fact educators, I feel like this is a well-represented group. So to all the artists out there uh, like myself um, who are uh, struggling uh, with a lack of a gigging economy right now, uh, I'm with you and, and let's keep learning together and, and trying to make the best use of our time being creative in this this odd time. Excellent. Um, so, Michael, how, how does an online college approach developing new courses? Berkeley Online has been doing this for a while. So, again, you know, we have some, this is not something you've been figuring out overnight, per se. So, first, let's speak to kind of how do you develop a new course and make lessons plans for an online course? Sure. Well, when we started um, about 20 years ago, uh, which is like the Stone Age for online learning, um, we started off by taking uh, proprietary coursework that um, had been taught at Berkeley since 1945, how we approach harmony, how we approach ear training, how we approach counterpoint, and taking some of that and breaking it down into its core. Um, so we're not just casting a lecture, um, but breaking it down and then putting it back together so that the elements are best, uh, uh, best reorganized for an online or digital learning. And then once we hit kind of critical mass of all of the curriculum that we really wanted to uh, to get out there to the broader world who can't come here to Boston, um, we relied more and more on on you, on polling the industry, talking with people at Folk Alliance or other places that we're at, and um, trying to stay ahead of the curve, uh, seeing if there are more students who are interested in uh, electronic digital instruments or film scoring or songwriting for uh, film, games, and TV, and we kind of develop curriculum based on, on market demand. Well, excellent. And then when you have a course, I mean, how does one go about organizing what your curriculum might be um, and thinking through the different steps of, of what people need to learn to get to those next levels? Yeah, so the curriculum, usually comes from the industry itself. So if it's a new discipline that we haven't taught before, we're working with the, the movers and shakers in the industry who are living that life and breaking down all the fundamentals and building up from that fundamental uh, fundamental level to a mastery level um, and always having a project-based approach in mind so that at the end of any course, you have something tangible that you can take with you. Uh, for example, if you are taking like a film uh, film scoring or uh, composition from film games and TV class, you're not only learning, hey, here's some different scores that are written in a comedy style or a horror style or an adventure style. Um, you're also writing music yourself and you're writing it to different mini, uh, uh, I guess, mini visual scenes. So at the end of the class, you're going to have a demo reel of five minutes of your own music that you can use to pitch to a music supervisor, somebody who's showing, hey, not only have I taken this class, I have um, kind of a, a really good example of how I can write in all these different genres, which can make you more marketable. So every one of our classes tries to have one or two project-based outcomes that you can use to help further your career as an artist, composer, or anything like that. Uh, the other thing I would mention about um, developing lesson plans for an online environment and this is important for anybody who's um, being forced into the online world because there's physical distancing that's happening um, we elected to do it 20 years ago but a lot of schools are kind of taping their lectures right now and hoping for the best saying oh 
I've been teaching macroeconomics for so long. I'm just going to put a video camera on myself and, and hope for the best. Um, I'd advise against that and really leverage the strengths that the, the online platforms can have. For example, if you're teaching about um, the modes, right, like Ionian, Phrygian, all of that, uh, oftentimes it's described in levels of lightness and darkness, which can be really powerful if you have a gifted orator who's talking about Lydian through Locrian and how those different color patterns can really do as much as, as thinking about, oh, it's a lowered third or a lowered seventh. Uh, but that's really hard to convey in a, a lecture format. However, in an online format, if you take that concept from a really intelligent, um, gifted creator, you can develop animations or different ways to describe that that will resonate with an audience in a much better way. Um, Another thing you can think about is technique. Like if I'm playing, uh, I'm, I'm a banjo player and um, a number of folk instruments uh, is kind of what I do in addition to piano. It can be difficult to like zoom in on your mind on like Bela Flex fingers and seeing like what his pick striking is or, or Dare Angle's, you know, bow angle. Um, however, in an animation or a different kind of visual, you can get in a little bit deeper without being really socially awkward and like, being right up in someone's uh, business. Um, so the format can, uh, if you're creative with it, you can convey a lot of advanced information in new ways that are just not possible in a physical setting. Yeah, I think it's been really interesting to, to think what is the content that's being created just to get through in, in higher education? What's the content that's being created to just to get through the semester versus what is evergreen content that will be able to be used online again because it was thought through before being made, that's really good advice. And um, an interesting thought too, as to how to source, you know, some of that type of footage. When, when educators have ideas, where are they, how are universities structured to support the development of content like this? So while we might not all have that at home, it's interesting to look at how a university goes about actually properly creating an online course to have that type of rich content. And mm -hmm. what, what could we do at home that's like that? Um, what are you seeing professors do? I love your your example of zooming in on someone's hand. What what else are you seeing professors at Berkeley do? Well, the the thing about Berkeley is we don't leave it just to the the faculty to make those creative decisions. Um, it's a partnership with a lot of our course development staff. So we've got educational design experts who are working with the faculty to kind of pull the best um, the best of their pedagogy out and to to challenge them to put it in some of these different uh, formats. Um, so thinking of different elements that you could bring out in a more asynchronous nature, since I know Ali and Brad were talking about synchronous versus asynchronous, um, there are some concepts that are uh, more easily retained if you can view them over and over and over again. Like if I go to a lecture and I hear somebody um, speaking about lyric writing and it's really powerful and it resonates with me, um, at the end of the day, I'm a human being. So my brain can only remember and retain so much of that. However, if I can have that concept in an asynchronous manner, whether it's an animation or a audio recording or an exercise, um, I have the opportunity then to, to master that. So we try and find what those critical points are and make sure that we embed them into the asynchronous nature and then complement with synchronous live lessons. Yeah, it's interesting too to, to try to, bring. that's amazing, and also to try to bring back, at times I'll bring back visual elements from other lectures to tie things together, and the extra visual somehow also uses another part of your brain to tie those two things together, which can be subtle, um, but really helpful. Uh, let's now let's welcome. I know Rachel, you've been very patient. Uh, let's let's uh, now welcome uh, Rachel, artist, advocate, and music instructor Rachel Bayman. Uh, Rachel's most recent album, Shame, was featured on NPR's Songs We Love, called a rootsy wake-up call from Folk Alley. 
Uh, additional recordings have included collaborations with Molly Tuttle, Josh Oliver, Mike Wheeler, Shelby Means, and of course, Ten, Ten String Symphony with Christian Settlemeyer. Uh, today, Rachel is here to share her knowledge as, as a fiddle and songwriting instructor uh, who is teaching online and offline already before COVID-19 um, and has expanded her teaching while off the road during this time. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. Great to see you all again. Since our time, I so wonder. Boring. I wonder. Uh, is there anything you'd like to? I have some questions for you, but I wonder if there are things you want to speak freely from before I do that. Yeah, I just had a quick um, note because I've been listening in. I'm imagining that a lot of people are tuning in, are maybe artists wondering how to transition to doing more teaching since there's no um, gigs. So. I just wanted to say um, there's been so many amazing options presented for different platforms that we could use. Um, I think it's important if you are not like already a professional instructor to think about what you're going to enjoy teaching in addition to what people want you to teach. Because I think it's really easy when you're transitioning from being a performer to a teacher to you know, either get really burnt out or present really uninspiring material if it's not making you feel inspired. Um, so there's there's a plethora of options for what you can do. And I think that these amazing um, platforms also require a lot of input and time if you wanna do them right. And I think that they can reward, give you a greater financial reward um, for your time, but, they definitely require a commitment of being a good, you know, that you want to spend your time developing a curriculum. Um, but there's options for doing things on a smaller scale, just if you're feeling really intimidated by the idea of like writing huge lesson plans and everything. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, think about what, how you want to spend your time as an artist, what makes you feel inspired and sort of take that as a, um, as your, guidelines for what you should be doing because you're going to be a better teacher when you're feeling good about teaching uh so rachel i want to get down to sort of um you know some of the brass tacks of how do you monetize this and how do you engage students um yeah so how do you first of all how did you figure out or at any given time uh, whether it's now during this time when you're not on the road and when you're on the road again how do you figure out how many lessons per week you have bandwidth to teach? Um, yeah, I think it's going to change depending on your schedule. I mean, for me, I've always had a really, really inconsistent schedule. So pre-coronavirus, um, my teaching availability really depended on um, how much I was touring. And often I would um, meet with people just based on when I was home. So most of my students have come from people that have found my music or just word of mouth being in a community of um, instrumentalists. Someone's looking for a fiddle teacher. Are you around? Cool. Great. Take this. So that's very like, it can be very like, let's do a few lessons and then I'm gone for three months and then we try again. You know, um, being in this kind of new world, obviously my schedule is a lot more, um, regular and as in I'm not doing anything. So there's options to teach all the time. Um, so I think it just goes back to kind of what I was saying. How much do you want to be teaching? How much do you want to spend your time doing that versus other things? I do think that when we talked to Kimber, who's another um, instructor and in the fiddle player in Delamay, she made a good point that when you're moving to online, you might want to consider shortening your lessons because the attention span is a lot more difficult through a screen, especially with kids. So for me, um, I kind of felt like I preferred meeting with more advanced students monthly versus beginner students weekly, but it just depends what you're passionate about teaching. Like for me, I'm not passionate about teaching kids to start learning the fiddle. That's like a very specific skill set that I don't feel like I necessarily have. But some people are awesome at that. And if you do that, you could definitely be teaching every week for half an hour. So it's really up to you what you want to be doing. Um, 
what Allison and Brad kind of brought up about um, having a platform where you can make one lesson and that lesson can reach many, many people. That's an awesome thing that I've just started thinking about. I think it does require a certain level of input and preparation that you need to be ready to commit to. So, you know, depending on where you're at. Yeah, sometimes for artists, the ad hoc ability to pop up and teach and then not be able to teach as much is actually useful, that freedom. Exactly. Um, how, do you, how do you manage communications with your pupils, um, arranging lesson times, delivering lessons, um, practice plans, and collecting the fees that are being paid to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, pre-corona, it was very sporadic. So it would just be like, cool, we, we arranged a lesson via email. We had a lesson, send me a Venmo or PayPal or paying cash or whatever. Um, since I've been teaching more frequently, I was finding that really uh, hard to keep track of because you don't, I think people are less aware of just paying immediately when it's online versus in person. Um, but I'm finding like Google Calendar to be really helpful in terms of making the online meeting, which is something you can't do for an in-person meeting. And I actually moved all of my students into um, a Patreon page so that they would just be paying monthly into that. I mean, it does take a cut, so I would be making more if they paid me directly. But um, any of the platforms that you can, like if, I guess if you're looking for more students and you don't feel like you have a great reach personally, like you're not a touring artist that people know or you don't have a great network of other people who can spread the word about your teaching, that's when you would probably want to be looking for a platform to help you find students. And those would also offer monetization and scheduling um, things for a cut again. Um, so, for me, it was helpful not to have to be like chasing up invoices for every lesson. Some people are very organized about that. And if you are organized, then just do it yourself because you'll, then you'll get all the money. All those yeah, dollars. One, one, another tool we've found helpful is Calendly to schedule. Like, because mm -hmm. it's true when you're an artist, it may not be. If, you're, if there's the skill set of teaching and having the, the abilities to share with others, then the whole administrative side can be really um, take time consuming. Uh, so, um, there are, yeah, some of those scheduling tools that sync up with your Google calendar can be useful. Um, how do you assess someone's skill level? And I think it's particularly interesting to say, how do you do that in the online environment? So that might be when they first come to you as a, as a student. Um, but also how are you able to see their progress with the tools you are using and maybe share with us what tools you're using to teach lessons. Yeah, online teaching is really interesting. There's a few things with, this is specifically, I think, with teaching someone to play an instrument. There's a few things that are really hard to do online. Um, when I, so per your question, when I meet someone for the first time, I'll just ask them, I mean, assuming they already play the instrument a little bit, I will ask them to just play something for me so that I can get an idea of where they're at rhythmically, um, intonation wise, you know, do they read music? Are they learning by ear? Just kind of, I think you can tell a lot when someone just plays one thing for you. Um, moving to the online space, like I, I teach fiddle a lot. You have to be really mindful of reminding people about holding, you know, the posture, the way they're holding the instrument. These are things that you notice really easily in person, but depending on how the camera is, you might not be able to see that person's hands. Um, with kids, it's it's really hard because I think when you're learning online, there's a there's a greater responsibility on the student to be checking themselves. Like it really has to be in order to get the most out of it, the student has to be ready and willing to learn. And with kids, sometimes they just want to show up and be told and or with adults, but I'm just generalizing, I think you get better at learning to learn and, and learning that like, if you don't, if you're not willing to question and make your adjustments, then you're not gonna get anywhere. Whereas oftentimes kids just wanna get through it and be done, which is totally fine. I was like that as a kid, but um, that's really hard. So that's something to watch out for. And then rhythm is really hard because you can't play with someone. So when you play along together, you can immediately feel what's happening with the rhythm. And more importantly, the student can feel what's happening with the rhythm. 
And um, often if you're playing something over Zoom or FaceTime or whatever, suddenly there's latency and it sounds like they're slowing down, but it's just the internet slowing down. You know, there's all this crazy stuff that happens. So, I mean, I spend so much time just being like, okay, here's how you practice with a metronome, you know, pull up this cool drum track on GarageBand, play along with it. Like, but at the end of the day, the responsibility is really on the student because in person I could, I could do that with them and train them on it. But over the internet, you really have to just say like, it's, it's going to work best for the motivated student who knows how to learn. And that's kind of like a whole nother skill set. So yeah, it's challenging. It's not impossible. I think that's true. As online instructors, you're often teaching, helping, teaching someone how to learn um, yeah. in addition to the what you're teaching. Now, there's something that Brad said earlier and also in one of the surveys that came in before this, this came up, um, which it which is about accountability and fostering accountability. And I think it's kind of cool, like Brad was referring to uh, alleviating some of that pressure, that performance pressure, he called it, um, when someone comes to the classroom and is intimidated. And I think earlier when you said, uh, you know, usually to assess skill, I have someone play for me. And that first time playing for you is very pressuresome, right? Um, totally. But I wonder how much of that account, that effort, that moment of feeling that you're responsible to this person in real time, that you're taking up their time, that you're sitting in their room, but now you're sitting in their computer. Um, you know, what role, how, what is a, is there positive pressure? I mean, what role, how, how do you create a sense of accountability in a more detached teaching method? Yeah, I mean, sometimes it, it can be, if we're talking about live real time, I think it can create a little bit more pressure even because you can't play with the person. So often if someone is nervous about attempting something, I would go, okay, let's do it together. They don't feel like they're just doing it alone. Well, I can't do that. So I just have to go, okay, now try improvising to nothing by yourself. You know, that's really scary and really hard. So um, I think if you're somebody who really, like if, if you're a student who really struggles with, you know, feeling like you can't deal with that, then the idea of doing the um, asynchronous learning would probably be really awesome because that completely takes the pressure off on both ends. Um, I know like my dad is an adult uh, fiddle student and he tried to take some fiddle lessons from the person I learned with when I was a kid and he could not deal with it. Like he just, he couldn't deal with being told everything he was doing wrong. He's like, I know, I just, you know, I already know what I'm doing wrong. I just haven't fixed it yet. And um, he, he loves though, my husband does a Patreon where he releases fiddle tune lesson videos and he loves those. Of course, he's not getting any feedback. He's just trying his best to do it. So, you know, I enjoy learning from asynchronous videos. Like I do that a lot, but I also feel like I've, I sort of know enough to know what I'm doing wrong and question myself on that. Whereas like, I think some people do that to avoid being pointed out what they're actually doing wrong. So, you know, and it's, it's fine because some people just want to have fun and play and like, it doesn't really matter, you know, but if you're, I think you have to be very honest with yourself about, are you just avoiding criticism because it makes it harder or, or do you actually get better learning that way? And I tend to be a very like confrontational type of teacher. So I'm, I want people to really take the hard route and learn it right but also people are hobbyists and they just want to have fun. So like, it's, it's totally up to the student, up to the teacher. And I think there's a, there's a way for everyone. It does sound important to assess that. What type of learner are they? And, and, and what, um, you know, why are they taking lessons probably? And, um, and how can you support that agenda? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I have some, I mean, I have a few students who are very serious that really want to be professional musicians. And I think for those students, it's really important that they get the hard kind of criticism because that's really what is going to make you improve at that level. But if you're um, just somebody who wants to do something for fun, like the most important thing is that you're enjoying your time. And if like if taking a live lesson with someone who's very intense just makes it miserable for you, then definitely, you know, look, you can find other resources for that. Yeah, I think my goal is for my dog to not run out of the room when I play. So I think I need to have someone witness my form. 
<laughs> yeah, I know. Well, I think I that's know. a really interesting take. So, so now let's have a bit of a round robin, okay? There was this topic of recruitment, marketing, and how to reach people, and I think we'll we'll mix some engagement, and and then there are some questions coming in the chat, which I'm excited about, um, and it, I've had to resist. I've had to resist peppering them in here because I think uh, the 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 folks who are attending have deserved to be recognized for their questions. But um, but uh, you know, I think that um, one of the questions that's come up is is this live lesson synchronous and asynchronous has come up a lot here. And I think one takeaway I'm starting to have is you kind of it, it it helps to have both. Um, mm. And uh, but I'm I'm wondering. Um, let's see. Uh, it does seem too that going back over all the different uh, choices y'all are making, you're mixing multiple forms of media. So even when you're in uh, certain pl your own platforms, or um, Mike, we Michael, we didn't get to talking about uh, what LMS. Berkeley Online is in, but I assume Berkeley Online is using a, a proprietary LMS. Learn, uh, sorry, LMS is learning. What does that stand for? Learning, I wrote it man down. learning management learning system. Management system. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we use, uh, we use a customized kind of hat or shell on top of um, Canvas, which is a pretty okay. well-known LMS. Okay. Yeah, and at MTSU we use D2L, um, but we're combining that with Zoom call meetings and, and 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 all kinds of things so certainly everyone is using a lot of different technology even when there's a central platform that's organizing it all um, i do love that um, this notion that uh, i presume that truefire you have the 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 way you said that your learning has been logged and you can go back to that and um and i think for rachel um, i imagine that's a combination of people having their own notebooks and keeping track of what they're working on in their progress. So um, I'm, I'm curious of how you, any of you identify, um, maybe before the marketing question, how, how do any of you identify when someone's ready for new material, what new material is delivered to them, um, how much of it is their choice versus choice of instructor? Because that's one topic we didn't quite get to is sort of that how do you decide when it's time to move on to the next thing and how much is it in the student's choice uh what the next thing is they get and maybe by raise of hand i'll call on someone so it doesn't get confusing who's going to speak does anyone want to speak to that topic brad please uh you're muted my yeah, friend you're muted. A little on mute there my friend yes sir here it comes little green button Got it. Yeah. Better? Okay, so I loved Rachel's point about how some of our students are, you know, hobbyists, hobbyists. They just want to have some fun and they're, you know, cherry picking around and she plans her curriculum uh, 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 and what she teaches around that student while others are much more serious about it. I, I, I think, I, I think that's a really, really good practice to, you know, I have had teachers in the past that have forced me through their curriculum and it didn't exactly, you know, motivate me or excite me. So I, I think it's a student by student thing that you identify what it is that they're looking for. And if they're a cherry picker, you give them something new and cool to fool around with that week. If they're more serious, they probably align themselves with your particular you know, regimen and curriculum. Would you say that's true, Rachel? Yeah, um, something I was gonna say is that it, if a student comes to you because of your music, um, and we have a lot of people watching that probably have this situation, um, then they probably are going to want you to sort of guide them through how did you learn how to do exactly what you did or like, how do you play this specific song? Or I like your style of guitar playing, you know, if they're coming to you for that reason. And so that can be um, sometimes a little bit easier because you're, you know, they're wanting specifically you. So that's a little bit different than if you're working for a platform um, 
or you just get a student through a referral that's like, I want to learn the fiddle and they really have no idea, you know, maybe they like Lindsey Sterling videos. It's like, you just have no idea what they think of that. Now, I do think it's a really amazing thing if you can expose someone to new music and like help them grow their taste in music, especially if they're a kid um, or they're just someone who's sort of new to a style, they've come into it. Maybe they, you know, were a huge Grateful Dead fan, but they've never heard like traditional bluegrass and you can kind of guide them to these things that they end up falling in love with head over heels. So I think there's a very delicate balance of pushing people to try and experience new things, but still keeping it fun. And again, you just have to read the student, you know, do they, how much do they want to grow and how much do they just want their comfort zone? And everybody's, you know, different in that regard. You know, the, the same thing's true in a higher education environment where it is different in some ways because there's a standard syllabus. You know, you know, in the following 16 or 12 weeks, you're going to know how to play all of your, like in a guitar class, your minor major triads, all of your bar chords, all inversions, sus chords, drop twos, drop threes. So it's kind of finite, like you have to acknowledge I'm signed up to accomplish all of that. But there are students that you work with um, to help beef up concepts where they're a little bit weak on and you do follow how they dictate it like here's what I'm trying to do here's where I'm at here's different songs I want to learn and then you also take it on the other level people that are the the core syllabus is a little bit more review for them and they want to expand a little bit beyond and I've seen when I've teach when I've taught uh, privately um, focusing on just like you said Rachel a tune or an artist that somebody likes and then if they're not at that level, just simplifying a little bit so mm -hmm. that they can feel that engagement and that excitement. And that's going to help them want to practice and want to grow and, and ultimately have fun with it. I think I have a follow on to that, too, that is just um, uh, one of the questions from the Q&A uh, is, do you sell your lesson, uh, your lesson books and lesson um lesson material let me see if I can find that um, the the question is I still teach out of my favorite lesson books do you sell the lesson books and materials to accompany your online lessons or are they part of the class fee but I also kind of want to add to that question um, is do you find that creating custom content for those lessons so I've taken lessons from people I don't let's let's pretend I'm not a musician but maybe I am not but uh, but I have taken lessons from people who record who had me buy someone else's recordings, which showed things slow and faster. And then I've also taken lessons from an instructor who played things live for me and we recorded them. And then I had them, my teacher actually playing the things. And, and, and this question from the field too about books and plans and, and is that a way to additionally monetize or you know, what Absolutely. is it's... recommended here? It's very much a part of, you know, if you're teaching, it's a business, right? So we were just talking about, uh, you know, satisfying the needs of each student so that that student keeps coming back and, you know, you're generating ongoing revenue, right? Um, the big thing today, for example, I took a couple of courses at Berkeley Online, which I loved, knew exactly what I was getting into and you know what I was committing to and you would buy the books that accompany the course right so um, I, I think that's brilliant right you're generating revenue from the actual learning experience you're generating revenue from the you know the books that are being published and if you look online say on YouTube you see people like Tim Pierce Rick Beato Paul Davids these are like major players on YouTube with million, uh, you know, a million subscribers, right? But their money is being made on the books that they've offered and are selling. That's where their big money is. So absolutely, you know, if you have something, uh, 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 and you know, even in the world of True Fire, most of the artists, in fact, all of the artists that are teaching privately or teaching on channels, they all have true fire courses. So very naturally, and of course, you know, we track, um, you know, their students are also buying their courses. So it absolutely makes sense to, to think that through. And if you don't have a course or you don't have a book, 
Um, look at Ellis Paul, for example. He's got these fantastic uh, charts that he sells that show a wheel of creativity when writing songs. He sold thousands of these things, very much a part of the equation. Yeah, and I think it's a little bit like what Michael said, too. I mean, I think just even thinking about my own educational things, I get into a live situation or a workshop, and I know I'm only retaining X percent. And it's like you have this sense or this feeling that you want to be able to document that other that other component, or you know that you're going to be ready for that other concept they just mentioned, like a little bit later, you know, you, you're sort of just like, it's just slightly out of your grasp and you, and you know, you're going to be able to return to it later. And so being able to like, you know, monetize not only the, the content, but also that experience to be there for them now and be them for them when they're, you know, offline from you is really an important component of, of helping them evolve, you know? Rachel, you have something you'd like to add? Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, if anyone is listening and feeling sort of intimidated about the idea of writing a whole book or coming up with the whole curriculum, um, I think Patreon is a really awesome way that you can monetize your con your teaching content on a small scale. Um, if you don't feel like you have like a, this huge curriculum or you don't want to put that much time into writing a book, you can put up a few lesson videos and you know that creates a paywall if people want to learn that lesson or um, if you have a chart or something like what Brad was mentioning. Um, I think that's a kind of a smaller scale and then maybe that could help you eventually get to the point where you feel ready to create a book or do a whole course or whatever. Um, I've just found that to be really, I've been doing some um, songwriting workshops via Patreon and that's been a really nice kind of low key ease into that um, where you have multiple people attending a zoom meeting and you do like a live songwriting mm -hmm. workshop. So just wanted to add for people easing into that situation. The um, question too, kind of in that vein was there, we have a question that was posed to Rachel, but to be honest, I think others might have a chime in on this too, which is um, a question from Rochelle. I would love advice on how to adjust live lessons to be successful without that intimate in, in-person connection. And I'm gonna, cause I keep extending all their questions. Yeah. I'm gonna extend that to say, how do you create that int intimacy? And I, I think it's very clear Rachel is teaching classes in this way, but I'm going to extend that question to others too, because I think we all would believe that a level of intimacy, a sense of intimacy is probably important. I know as a professor, I've been way more up close to my students than I usually am in a, a lecture hall. Like I usually have a real boundary and this semester has just been like, welcome to my world. So, um, so, but that intimacy is different online. So I'm curious, um, professional intimacy, let's say, uh, what, um, you know, Rachel, I'll let you lead, but maybe the others might want to chime in. Just raise your hand if you'd like to chime in on that topic. Um, so I think if I understand the question correctly, it's about creating intimacy in a non, well, there's, when you're not there's live? When you are on teaching online, so versus being in a room with someone oh, okay. is very okay. intimate. Um, and then I think what the questioner, I could be wrong, but I think what the questioner is suggesting that with the screen between you, it takes a step yeah. back, mm -hmm. uh, which you can say that maybe you don't feel that way if that's how you feel. I'm just curious kind of what, was, what is your perspective on that question? Yeah, I was curious. I think that in online, truly I don't feel less um, personal, interpersonal, um, intimacy, like you said, it's almost more intimate in certain ways um, because you can't control the environment and then you have to be like, oh, sorry, my dog's barking. Um, but I do feel like you, if you're doing something that's a, what was, what was a uh, synchronous, that could be different because you're just watching a video made for many people. And one thing I thought with that is like, really injecting personality into that, I think can really help um, not being afraid to be slightly imperfect so that people really feel like they have a real person talking to them versus a very generic instructor. Um, you know, letting letting mistakes happen, joking around, I think it gives it a more live feel than just like, now pick up your bow. You know, like you really <laughs> want to 
feel like you're talking to one person even though you're talking to a, a group. Maybe someone else has other things to say. Yeah. All right, I've got something to say. Um, so I, I taught a class this morning um, and there's students from all over the world. This was a synchronous class or a synchronous part of um, a Harmony class. And there's a, you know, a student from, uh, from Brazil who's living in Italy. There's a student from Brazil who's living in Brazil. There was a student who's in Vermont. Um, and you do the usual things. You, you get to know these folks. Like after a uh, week in and week out, you, you learn about them and you ask about them. You make it very personal. Like I care about what's going on in the middle of Vermont right now versus Italy versus Brazil. And I know who's an artist who's got a new album coming out, what type of music they're trying to work on. And uh, like today, for example, this, this uh, gentleman from Vermont, he's a guitarist and he really likes, ironically enough, because there's so many Brazilians in the class, uh, Brazilian uh, music. So we were talking about voice leading 251 progressions and we looked at The Waters of March by Antonio Carlos Obim and the, the Brazilian folk in the class were like loving it. So we got to go through these specific examples that really spoke to their personalities and their cultures and their interests. Um, and it wasn't part of the lesson plan necessarily. We were just talking about 251 progressions, but that kind of an intimate knowledge of the people that you're teaching and um and communication to what interests them just just meeting them where they're at and being uh fluid in all different kinds of genres of music and, and disciplines is a really uh, useful way to connect i would say yes, i just would like to add on to that that you know given what's going on in the world today there's a you know a paradigm uh of people moving to this online video world, right? Um, you can't even buy certain webcams anymore. Um, so people's be, be behavior is really changing. You know, you know, probably, I don't know, 10 times as many people are doing Zoom meetings or Skype meetings or go-to meetings. And there's something really cool. I mean, just look right here, Rachel, you know, we're in Rachel's house for God's sakes. Look at that nice little space she has, you know? Um, you get to see people in their own environment, the books on their wall, the guitars in their background. There is something very, very personal about that. And to Rachel's point, you know, you're having fun, you can make a mistake, you're making jokes. It, it actually is very personal, very relaxing. And in some ways, even better than being up close and personal, you know, in somebody's face. Not that that's a bad thing, I'm, I'm really, the point I'm making is this is not that far from that type of experience, you know? Yeah, I think that's an amazing point. I've, I've thought that of how will it even change, um, you know, there's so many more people turning their cameras on on calls than like you could ever get them to do before because it's becoming a part of, of, of that. And, and how can we, you know, uh, it's gonna be interesting to see what changes uh, you know, my, Michael, your work in recruitment, I wonder what that's going to be like now, um, you know, and, and, and how different that might be if, if, if students who before weren't, weren't considering online education are now. Um, I, a final question from the Q&A, and this will be our final question. Um, uh, I have a, I'm going to just read it to you because it's beautiful, it's eloquent. I have a strong word of mouth connection as a private piano instructor in my community. I would love to reach more people with online lessons outside of my area. Any advice on increasing one's reach? I'd like to keep my teaching focused around my established studio website versus joining another platform, but I am open to the possibilities. Thank you. And maybe I'll just add to that too, because it came up in a conversation once before, because I add to every question, is um, this person is talking about how to extend their geographic reach. And I think Rachel has spoken well to when an artist has a following and they have a fan base who might take lessons from them. And I, and I know it's very hard right now for online instructors who are trying to reach people who don't know who they are um, and this, this extra question. So Brad, did you already have your hand up on that yeah, one? Just really quickly, I think Rachel answered that earlier, you know, uh, moving, you know, creating a Patreon um, a location is like setting up a satellite office someplace that will reach a lot more people. And some of those people that will find Rachel 
in the Patreon world will wind up coming to Rachel in her own world, right? So you just have to kind of get out there and spread the word. You have to leverage, you know, the reach of the online world by going to different places, whether that's YouTube, Instagram, Patreon, um, and that's how you you extend your own reach. Rachel, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, I would suggest uh, definitely using social media, finding groups. There's a lot of um, Facebook is kind of best right now for groups, and there's some really good interactive groups of, around interests. So if you're a piano teacher, if you go in and find some kind of like piano lover group and you make a free 20 minute lesson, post it up on there, post it on your own social media, try to do some targeted advertising, message everyone you know that's a piano player and be like, do you know anyone who's looking for lessons? Because like oftentimes as an instrumentalist, you get a lot of work from your fellow instrumentalists that do the same thing as you because either they don't want to or they have a conflict or so um, people that you might think of as your competition, make them your friends, make them your advocates, tell them what you're doing um, so that you guys can pass work back and forth. And yeah, just, just use all of those outlets. You'll be amazed where people find, I mean, honestly, people will be like, I saw you on X like little interview for some random website or post on some random group that you thought nobody saw. And now I want to take lessons with you. So yeah, get get on social media. Don't be afraid. Put yourself out there. You know, nobody will nobody will fault you for it. They'll just want to support you. Excellent. Yeah, and Thank you. So YouTube What's is that, a Allie? good place for YouTube is a good great place. Like if you make a you know a little you know video of you playing and the like kind of presentation of what it is that you're doing and have good keywords. You know, people find those things and drives traffic to your Patreon or your website. And so it's another location for you to get the word out and spread, you know, the love, so to speak, um, around the world. Well, I just want to thank all of you speakers. You've been incredibly eloquent and knowledgeable, and I appreciate you taking the time out to share your knowledge with the community. I also want to thank uh, all the attendees here. I'm going to hand over to Tressa, who has some uh, final remarks to share with everybody as well. And uh, thank you, Tressa and Folk Alliance. Well, thank you, Michelle, and thank you everyone for joining this webinar presented by Folk Alliance International. We hope that you have found the ideas presented here useful to you. A huge thank you to our esteemed panelists, Rachel Bayman, Michael Moyes, Allison Hosbach, and Brad Wenkos. Please remember, oh, and also Michelle, again, thank you so much for your wonderful